Um, my name is Dave Johnson, and I'm here to talk about how to contribute to Apache user grid. Um, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know, or everything that I can tell you within, within 50 minutes. Um, I know a bit about this topic because I'm a contributor to Apache user grid, and I've been working with the Apache Software Foundation for almost 10 years now. Um, I also am, and I'm, have been working on user grid for the, for the past uh, nine months or so as an employee of Apigee. Apigee uses user grid to power um, app services and other, other products that provide um, um, backend as a service capabilities. So um, I decided to do this talk because I know from experience that um, it's really hard to grow an open source community around a product unless you can make it really easy for people to, to contribute. And so this is part of it, my effort to try to make it easier for people to contribute to Apache um, user grid. So the, uh, the first question I had to consider when coming up with this talk is what is the audience? Who cares about, why, about contributing to Apache user grid? So I think there are three kind of categories. One of them is people who are running user grid in production um, <clears throat> or who plan to run user grid in production. And if you're one of those people, then you, um, for better or worse, you probably have had to make some changes or will have to make some changes or bug fixes in user grid. And you would like those <clears throat> changes to be built into the product. You'd like to get them into the product so that the next time you upgrade, when you get the new copy of user grid, your, your changes are already in there. And you don't have to apply your patches. So I guess another, another, uh, another grouping of people who want to, are interested in that is if you're running user grid in production, you might want to monitor the project to make sure that it's not going off the rails. You want to kind of know how the project works, what, you know, what the roadmap is, um, you know, how, how things get into the product. Another group of people are just people who want to get involved, more involved with open source. So maybe some of those people are people who are just, you know, kind and generous people, and we welcome their contributions, of course. Or maybe some of those people are more mercenary and just thinking, I need to, to beef up my weak-ass resume. Um, and I guess the third, the third category here are ASF officers and directors, and they might want to know how we do contributions on Apache User Grid because they want to make sure that we're following Apache policies <clears throat> and procedures, and if we're not, they want to want to let us know. Um, so, so those are the categories of people. The topics that I'm going to cover are how to how to get the code for user grid, how to build it, how to run it, um, a bit about the internals of the different parts of the product, um, and then the contribution workflow. So that's how how you actually get changes into Apache user grid. And I'll also go into a little bit into the Apache user grid roadmap, kind of what, what we're working on and what we plan to, what we're planning to work on. So if you're not familiar with user grid, I'm going to briefly introduce it. So Apache user grid is, is a database and a lot more kind of wrapped in a REST API. And this can be used to provide a backend as a service or a database, um, database as a service. And it's really perfect for, for mobile applications. Um, but it's also good for really any kind of application, any kind of um, web application. Um, so because it's a database, we have this ability to store and query JSON entities and can also do file uploads, assets. Um, we also support authentication. So we have built-in concepts of roles and permissions um, and users. We also have a comprehensive admin portal and SDKs for a bunch of different languages. So JavaScript, um, Android, iOS, et cetera. So that's the quick introduction. So the first step to get started with user grid is to get signed up. And the first thing you want to do there, it's kind of weird, but you're going to send an empty email to dev-subscribe at usergrid.incubator.apache.org. And that's going to get you signed up to the mailing list. Um, and so it's worth mentioning that everything at Apache happens on a mailing list. So um, every discussion about project features, about um, every decision that's made, Everything needs to be reflected back on the user, on, on the mailing list. And we've got three different mailing lists. We've got one for developers, one for kind of user support, and then one for kind of robotic stuff, like JIRA notifications, GitHub notifications, stuff like that. That's the commit list. And so, you know, like I said, everything happens on the mailing list. And if it, if it didn't happen on the mailing list, then it really didn't happen as far as Apache is concerned. So the next thing you need to do is get signed up for our JIRA account, or get signed up for a JIRA account, and that's where we use JIRA to file 
to uh, file bug reports, to kind of plan new features, et cetera. So you're gonna wanna sign up for an account there as well. The, the uh, URL's at the top of the page. Um, and we work through GitHub. So you're also gonna need to get yourself a GitHub account. So there's the URL for that. If you don't already have one, you need to sign up, sign up for a GitHub account. And finally, you should, you should sign an ICLA form. So you actually have to print this form out and sign it, and it basically says that you've got the right to contribute the code um, to Apache User Grid. If, you've got, if you're employed, you should probably check with your employer, make sure that they know that you're doing this. Um, so yeah, so you basically sign that, fax it in, or send a scan copy into us. And once you've done that, you're, you're all set to, to get going with User Grid, and the first thing you're gonna wanna do is to get, get the code. So you can use your, your favorite Git or GitHub client. My favorite one is the command line, so there's the command you would use to clone the repo and get your own copy. So that's gonna take a couple of minutes to download all the code. And when it's done, you have, you have user grid, basically the whole thing. So all the, the stack, the portal, the SDK, et cetera. So these are the different areas in which you could contribute to user grid. So you can tr contribute to the stack. I'm gonna go into detail on each of these. The stack is you know, the web application that provides that REST API and that talks to Cassandra. There's the portal, that's the admin, the admin console. There are the SDKs, and there's also the documentation and the website. So just to uh, kind of show how the different pieces of user grid fit together, this is kind of the de typical deployment architecture. So on the right, we've got a Cassandra cluster. That's the database. Um, the blue boxes are the things that are part of user grid. So the stack can run on Tomcat or other, other Java web application servers. Um, the stack talks to Cassandra through a, a Cassandra client known as Hector. Um, typically, people will run multiple Cassandra instances behind a load balancer. And then we have all of the SDKs, our clients to the application. Um, so the iOS SDK, Android, et cetera. Now, you don't need an SDK to use user grid. You can write the HTTP calls yourself. You know, it's just a REST API, HTTP. Um, but the SDKs make it a lot easier. Um, the portal, you can see there, it actually uses the JavaScript SDK to communicate with the, the back end. Okay, so the first topic is the, the stack. So the stack is a, a, I guess, pretty typical Java web application. It uses JAX RS to provide a REST API. It uses um, Jersey, the Jersey flavor of JAX RS. It uses Spring for dependency injection. Hector is the Cassandra client. And it's composed of a bunch of Maven modules. To build the stack, you know, we, we've already got the code. To build the stack, you're gonna need to have Java 7, and you're gonna wanna have Maven 3.0.5. Um, I think there are problems with newer versions of Maven. We need to, to fix that. But you basically see the end of the stack directory, run Maven, clean, install, and, and you're done. That's gonna take a while because we have a lot of unit tests. We don't have, we don't have enough unit tests, but we do have a lot, and they take, they take a lot of time. So you can also skip the test by using the standard Maven skip test parameter. Once you've done that, the results of the, uh, of the build process are two things. There's a rest slash target slash root war. So the root war, that is the web application that is the stack. And there's also a launcher. And the launcher is really cool because it, it combines you know, all of the user grid code and Cassandra and a web, um, a web server. So you can basically just run this thing and bring user grid and the portal up on your desktop. So the way you do that, you go into the, the stack launcher directory and you run Java with the jar command and you reference that launcher jar. And once you do that, you will get, you'll see something like this. So a nice little GUI pops up, very simple GUI. And you can press the button to start user grid. Um, you can also press the little button that has the web browser to create, to uh, launch the portal. And so, you know, very quickly you can be up and running with user grid on your desktop. Okay, so if you wanna make changes to the stack, you need to understand the, the kind of internals of the stack. And you know, since it's Maven, you load it into any IDE, you're gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna be able to see all the modules and ex explore things and the dependencies, et cetera. There are a bunch of different modules, um, and they're all, there's some pretty interesting ones like a Mon MongoDB emulator and, uh, and uh, WebSocket support. Um, but the, core, the key ones to kind of understand the architecture are these four that I've listed here. So config, core, um, services and rest. So the config module, it's actually really simple. It's, it's just 
the default properties file for user grid kind of wrapped in a jar. So when you deploy user grid, you can provide your own properties file to override these properties, um, but these are the, the default ones. So that's a very simple module. The next module is the core. So these are the core features, the core features that we need to kind of to build user grid. And that's all about storing things in Cassandra, storing entities in Cassandra. Each one of these boxes is, corresponds to a Java class or a Java interface. Um, the key one to look at if you're trying to understand the architecture is the entity manager. Entity manager knows how to store, retrieve, update, and delete entities in Cassandra. And an entity, that's a Java class over there, an entity is just an object that has an ID, it has a type, and it has um, name value properties. Uh, if you're using user grid, typically you're gonna be storing dynamic entities. That means you can have any name value properties. There's no schema at all. But user grid also supports um, typed entities. So there's certain types of objects that user grid has special support for and defines the name value properties for them. You can also add your own properties to those things. So for example, we have a built-in support of a user, I mean, built-in support of the notion of a user, um, you know, roles as well. Um, activities, which is like activity streams, and assets, which are file, essentially file uploads. So we also have other services that are part of the core. We've got a counter serve, well, I should mention the relation manager. So user grid is built on Cassandra, a NoSQL database, so it doesn't have support for joins. So the relationship manager allows us to, to model connections between entities, do things like have users that follow other users, things like that. Um, we've also got a counter service, we've got a scheduler, we've got a queue, um, and a lock manager. So these are all the things that we need to kind of build the user grid application. At the bottom <clears throat> are the kind of dependencies of the stack. So it depends on the config module, con depends on Apache Commons, Cassandra, Hector client I mentioned for Cassandra. Um, we use Jackson for reading and writing JSON data. Uh, Spring, as I mentioned before, and user grid supports a query language. So you know, when you index things into, or store objects into user grid, we index every field. Um, and we support uh, a query language that you can use in URLs. And so we have um, Antler um, that allows us to kind of parse that query language and turn it into code that um, results in queries through Cassandra. All right, so building on the core, we have the stack services module. And this is really where all the, or the application logic for user grid lives. And it's kind of based around this notion of a service. And a service is a thing that can store, retrieve, update, and delete um, entities of a certain type, but it can also invoke actions, so invoke application logic. Um, so we've got a bunch of different types of services here. So generally a service for each one of those kind of built-in special objects that we have, um, so there's a service for, for user logic, service for, um, for assets, that's the file uploads, et cetera. Um, when you invoke a service, you do so by calling this invoke method and you pass in a service request. Um, there's also a service result that comes back from that and then there's a service action. So those things might seem kind of redundant. And we've got a web layer which has um, requests and response. And I believe the history here is that um, Jersey, Older versions of Jersey, actually, which we're still using, um, don't make it easy for us to extend Jersey resources. So we've kind of added some of that flexibility into this, into this layer. So the other things that are in the services are things that are related to authentication. So there's a, there's a security realm, there's a token service, there's a, a sign-in provider. And at the bottom, you can see the dependencies. So of course, services depends on config and core. We've also got Spring, we use Shiro for authentication. Um, JClouds to allow, allow us to upload file uploads to, um, to S3 and other cloud providers. And we've got Amber, which is an OAuth, OAuth library because we support OAuth as one of our authentication methods. So that's the services module. The REST module <clears throat> is built on top of that. And if you know JaxRS or Jersey, then the code here is gonna be pretty familiar to you, I think. Um, some of these resources, so we've got a root resource, um, but some of these resources correspond directly to the services classes that I mentioned before. Um, this is pretty straightforward, so I'm not gonna go into much more detail here. The dependencies here are config, core, and services, of course. Um, Jersey, Jackson, Spring, and Shiro, again, because we use the Shiro annotations to mark up the, the Jersey resources um, for authentication. 
so each one of the modules in, in user grid has, has pretty extensive tests. Um, they're implemented using JUnit. If you look at the test, you'll see that some of them are ending with the, uh, the names of the classes end with the word test. That means it's really a unit test designed to test one class or one method. We also have some of the tests that end with IT, so those are integration tests that test kind of the way multiple classes work together. Um, the, the tests, we have a pretty extensive test infrastructure. So when you run the unit test, we actually start up Cassandra, and at the end of the test, we shut down Cassandra. So that's so the integration test can kind of run with a real database. Um, the REST test also start up Jetty, so that tests can run against the, the REST API. And if you're, if you want to, um, if you're gonna make a mod, if you're gonna try to get your changes into user grid, you're gonna wanna definitely provide a test for your, for your new feature, and you're gonna wanna you know, address any test failures that your feature might be causing in other parts of, of user grid. Um, I guess the best way to kind of get started with writing tests is just to look at the tests that we already have and find ones that are testing, testing things similar to what you're adding and kind of follow the patterns in our, in our test codes. So if you want to test user grid in a kind of more production-like environment, um, one thing you might want to do is install Tomcat and Cassandra on your machine and deploy user grid to that. So here's a link here that um, has instructions on how to install on Cassandra and Tomcat locally. Um, of course, you could also run, you know, once you've made your changes, you could do a build and then run that launcher and ch make sure your changes are working in the launcher. Um, or if you're concerned with how your changes are gonna work in a distributed environment, um, here are a couple different ways to bring up a cluster. So we've got um, this URL has a project that provides a cloud, uh, AWS cloud formation script that can bring up an entire cluster. So whatever number of Tomcats and Cassandras you want. There's also a Vagrant, um, Vagrant and Chef option. So you can bring up a node on your desktop using Vagrant and Chef. And there's also a Vagrant that can bring up a three node cluster on your desktop. So those are all um, starting points. I say experimental because these are, um, you know, these haven't had a lot of testing. We're kind of developing, developing them and adding to them as we need them for our own purposes. All right, so let's talk about the portal. So the portal is an AngularJS application. Um, AngularJS is the new hotness for JavaScript. Um, and the portal was recently rewritten completely from, I guess it's jQuery, and now it's all Angular, all Angular JS. Um, and it looks really great. It's a very nice, very nice HTML5 and JavaScript application. It's pure, um, it's pure Ajax, so you don't need to have any server-side logic to run it. You can, you can make it work on you know, Apache HTTPD or Nginx or Tomcat or, or whatever you have. We use, um, as I mentioned before, it uses the user grid JavaScript SDK to talk to user grid. And um, you can also run it locally using Grunt. Grunt is our build system. And you can run it locally using Grunt, and that'll fire up Node.js and run it on your desktop using Node.js. So to build the portal, there are a couple of dependencies you need. You need to get Node.js. You need to install Grunt, so you can do that using the Node package manager. Those are the example commands there. Once you've got those in place, you just change directory into the portal directory. You run build sh, and the results of the build are gonna be in the dist directory. It's gonna be a zip file, and you can just take that zip file to, any, you know, to your favorite web server and, and unzip it, and you've got the portal up and running. So there's a link at the bottom to the readme that explains kind of in more detail how to, how to build the portal, how to run the, the portal tests. Okay, so if you wanna run the portal, um, but you don't necessarily wanna run the stack, we have an easy way for you to do that. So Apigee provides, um, provides app services, which is based on user grid. So you can go to Apigee, you can sign up for a, an account there, the account is free. Um, you, can, you can use it as your backend for up to 25 gigs of storage, I think is the, the limitation there. Um, but it makes testing the portal really easy. So you create your account, then you run the portal with grunt dev, that's the command that fires up Node.js, and then you navigate to localhost 3000 and you can log in with your app services credentials and you'll be, you know, you'll be able to see kind of the same thing that you would see if you went to Apigee app services. So that's my, that's my account. I've got a bunch of test, test applications in there. Um, 
You can also run the portal against your own stack. So if you, if you want to build your own stack and see how it works with them, um, you know, if you've made changes to the stack and you want to make maybe some corresponding changes to the portal, you want to run against maybe a local stack. So you can deploy it to Tomcat and Cassandra, or you could run the launcher. Um, and again, here what you do is you'd run the portal with grunt dev, but this time when you go to localhost 3000, you would add this parameter, API URL, and then you put the, the URL of, the, of your copy of the stack. So if you're doing the launcher, that would be at localhost 8080. And I say log in with super user, super user, that's, that's only if you're using the launcher. The launcher brings up, um, you know, creates a test application and a test organization and some users for you to test with. So if you do that, this is what you would, you would see. So there's a test application, et cetera. Okay, um, so the SDKs. So there are a bunch of SDKs. I think I've left off, there's a .NET SDK as well. I'm not gonna go into detail about how, to, how these, these guys work. Um, I don't think I have enough time for that. But generally, each one's gonna have a nice readme that tells you how to build it, how to test it, and how to, how to run it. And each one is gonna have kind of the, um, kind of its own flavor of build. So for example, if you're doing iOS, it's gonna build with Xcode. If you're doing Android, it's gonna build with the Google um, Android development kit, et cetera. Okay. Um, so let's talk about how you actually get your changes into user grid. So the, if you have some change that you wanna get into user grid, the, the best way to, to start is to talk about your change on the mailing list. Um, kind of propose what you wanna do. Um, start a conversation about it. Um, you might also wanna create a JIRA issue for your change and you know, get a discussion going, and, and once you've got some consensus that this is a good idea, um, you know, go ahead and do the work. Of course, if you don't hear back from people, that's, that's fine too. People don't always respond to, um, to these, these queries. That doesn't mean you, you don't have a good idea, um, but generally it's, it's a good idea to try to discuss your, your changes up front. Um, so then you wanna do the work, and the way you do the work is you, you're gonna fork our repo. So we've got a user grid, so you go to GitHub, user grid slash user grid repo, and you fork it, you make your changes in your fork, you add your tests, and then you, then you submit a clean PR against the appropriate branch of user grid, user grid. I say clean PR because you wanna make sure that, you're, that you're, your changes are just kind of the changes that are required for your, the feature that you're adding. You don't wanna have a bunch of extra stuff in there that's unnecessary, that's gonna be a distraction for whoever reviews your code. Um, and once you've, once you've created that PR, you should update your JIRA issue to refer to it and maybe announce on the mailing list, hey, I've, I've created the PR, I would love for folks to take a look at it um, and get it into the product. So just to go through those steps, um, this is the user grid repo, so user grid slash user grid, and up in the top right, there's a fork button, so that's what you would press to create your own fork. So for example, this is my fork, so you can see Snoop Dave, that's my GitHub username, so Snoop Dave slash user grid. So once you've done that, then you can, you can get the code by cloning it, and that's where you would make your changes. Once you've made your changes, you can, and you've kind of pushed them to your own fork of the repo, you can use the little, I'm not sure what the name of this button is on GitHub, but you can use this, the button up here in the, the green button in the, in the left to kind of diff, create a diff of your, your fork against, against user grid. So for example, you might see something like this. So you look at your diffs, make sure that it's nice and clean and it's got all the, all the stuff that you want. And once you've done that, then you press the button to create a pull request. And in the pull request, you're gonna wanna describe your changes. You're gonna wanna reference your JIRA issue. Um, and you filed, if you have a G ICAL on file, you're gonna wanna mention your name there because your name might not be the same as your, as your GitHub username. So my name is Dave Johnson, but my GitHub username is Snoop Dave. So make it easy for the user grid folks by putting your ICL na ICLA name there. Once you've done that, you press the send pull request button and, and you're off. So there are a number of different repos on user grid repos and it's a little bit confusing, uh, I think, to some folks once you realize the different repos and you kind of wonder why they're there. So this diagram kind of explains the different repos and their relationship. So on the bottom is the user grid user grid repo and like I said, when you, when you want to make a change, you fork that repo. So on the left there is your, your fork. You do your changes. Step three, you submit them back to the user grid, user grid repo. And then there's, a, there's a, essentially a cron job that runs, and it merges the changes or 
syncs the changes from user grid to user grid back to the official Apache Git repo. So Apache runs its own Git server, and that, and that server is really the system of record for the user grid code. So when we make an official release of user grid, it's gonna come out of that repo. That's step six there. Um, there's another repo on GitHub, and that is Apache slash incubator user grid, and that is just a read-only mirror of the official Apache Git. Okay, so that's, okay, so if you just have a really small change, a couple of lines to, to one file or something, you don't have to go through all of the, the stuff that I talked about before. You don't have to sign a CLA. You don't have to do all those things. If you have a very small change, you have two options. One option is to create a patch file and submit, submit it through JIRA. We, we'll accept that. Um, and when you do that through JIRA, there's actually a little checkbox that you have to check that says, I agree to submit this under the terms of the Apache license agreement. Um, another option is to do things through GitHub. Um, and if you don't have an ICLA and it's a small change, you can just you know, put a note in the, uh, in the description of your pull request and just say, I agree to license my change under the, under the ASL, under the Apache license. Okay, so let's talk about the website. This is the website, user grid website. Um, it's it's a very nice website. I'm not show, showing all the features, features here. There's a really cool map that shows kind of the, the location of all the user grid contributors around the world. We've got links to, you know, the documentation, the uh, GitHub account, the bug tracking system, our Stack Overflow, um, the Twitter account, et cetera. And the, the website is also where we have all of the documentation for user grid. And we've got pretty extensive documentation. Not enough, but it is, it is pretty extensive. Um, and it's all part of the website. So if you want to update those docs, you're essentially updating the website. And unfortunately, we don't have a really good situation here um, there's a requirement from Apache that the website has to be stored in subversion, and that's different from GitHub. So now we're introducing another, another system for you to deal with. Um, so that's URL at the top is the location of the, the subversion repository that contains this code. Um, the nice thing about the website is all the content is authored, authored in Markdown, and Markdown is a, you know easy to use text format. So it's really easy for you to author a new documentation for, for user grid. Um, I guess maybe the Another part of the problem is that our build process requires a bunch of different components. So what we do is we take that markdown and we use it to generate, you know, generate our static website. And we, the generator tool that we use is called Pandoc. It's written in Haskell, so you have to download and install that. We also use Python pigments. I'm actually not sure what we use that for. And then we've got a bunch of Ruby gems um, that kind of deal with, with Pandoc. And so you have to install a bunch of stuff um, to kind of build and run the website locally on your machine. Um, and then if you're not a committer on user grid, if you're just contributing, you have to submit patches through JIRA. So it's not a really great situation, and we're working to, to fix that. At the bottom here, there's a, uh, a link to a readme that explains the process, you know, the process of how you update the website and how you run it locally. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the roadmap. So the roadmap for the project, um, one of the most important things that we have to do is get a first release out through Apache. Um, user Grid's been around for quite a while and it's in use and production at a bunch of different sites and it's, you know, it's been on GitHub for a long time, but we, we've never made a release since we've been in the Apache incubator. And we've gotta make that release so that we can kind of prove that we know the Apache way. Um, and also we've got to, um, yeah, so that's kind of a requirement for graduation. The other thing that we're working on with user grid is a, kind of the next generation of user grid, user grid 2.0, and the main part of that is a new persistence engine. Um, and we also have other ideas about where to go with the product. There's a link here to a JIRA issue that um, kind of discusses the roadmap and, and ideas for new features in the future. So that, that first release that I mentioned, um, we're kind of slowly working towards that first release and at the same time working, working towards 2.0. But the things we need to do to get the first release out are to get the Apache license headers everywhere. You know, we've got them in the stack now. We still need to get them into the portal and all the different SDKs. We need to decide on how we're gonna package the, the product. Is it gonna be one big download or is there gonna be separate downloads for the, 
for the SDKs. Um, we need to get some installation docs in place. Um, and of course, we need to have a successful release vote. So we, this is one area where we, where we definitely, definitely need contributors to, to help us out. The 2.0 work that I, that I mentioned, um, this is in a, in a branch called 2.0. This is a work in progress. So in this branch, we've got a kind of a new, a new persistence library. So these are kind of new guts for that entity manager interface that I mentioned. Um, you know, we've had problems with user, some problems with user grid performance, mainly due to the way we, due to the way we do locking. And so our new approach is to use a technique called multi-version concurrency control. Um, but we're also doing some other changes. We're switching from Hector to, um, to Estionics as our Cassandra client. We're using kind of a reactive Java, Rx Java, um, a toolkit called Hysterix, and we're also using Git, I'm sorry, <laughs> Juice in this branch. Um, also in this branch, we've got an implementation of index and query that use Elasticsearch. In the existing user grid, we have all the index and query stuff um, implemented in Cassandra. Um, but it looks, like, it looks like Elasticsearch is gonna be a lot better option for us. So, um, I've actually blazed through this material pretty quickly, and so I've, we've got plenty of time for, for questions and, uh, and any discussion if anybody's interested in, in talking user grid. So are there any, any questions about the product or the project or how to contribute? So, so user grid already supports indexing and you know indexing and query, um, but like I said, it's all done using our own kind of Cassandra stuff and custom code. So what user grid, what what Elasticsearch is going to bring for us is we're not going to have to support all of that old code anymore, and it looks like Elasticsearch is a lot more performant than the the query and indexing code that we have in user grid now. Um, so basically, we're going to be supporting the exact same functionality, but we're going to be using Elasticsearch instead. But since we're using Elasticsearch, there are probably some additional, some new features we can add because there are a lot of kind of features that are in Elasticsearch that we don't support currently in, in user grid. Yeah, I mean that's the kind of yeah, and that's the kind of thing that we that we could do now that we have Elasticsearch. You know, that we don't have to we don't have to implement all that stuff ourselves. So we can start to ex expose more search functionality through through Elasticsearch. Right, right. And the the downside is that it's it's another component that you have to deploy when you're, when you're bringing up a user grid cluster. So now you have to worry about um, Elasticsearch nodes in addition to Cassandra nodes, but it actually looks pretty easy to, to deal with. Right. Well, I think Cassandra was chosen because of the, you know, the features that it has, linear scalability, et cetera. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that we couldn't support other databases in the future. I mean, we've got interfaces like the, the entity, entity manager interface, relationship manager interface. I mean, you could conceivably inter, you know, implement those with other, with other NoSQL databases or with a relational database or or whatever. You got something in mind? Right. Right. Thank you. 
Right. Yeah, we actually were having a discussion the other day about about Cassandra and about how the requirement to to use Cassandra might be might be something that turns turns people off because it is it is fairly difficult to stand up a cluster and deal with. You know, some people might want to just have a MySQL backend, for example, because that's so so easy. Um, but I guess I do I do think that it's, it's Cassandra is pretty. I don't know. Maybe entrenched, or I'm not sure what the word is, but the code the code base is it, you know it's kind of centered around Cassandra. We do have abstractions like that entity manager, um, but I think it would be a huge amount of work to kind of re-implement that for another database. Or I guess what you're suggesting is you could re you could implement the entity manager with calls to Gora, and then you'd have you know whatever databases that Gora supports. I think that would be it. Yeah, that's interesting.